Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the robotics seminar, the robotics colloquium that we have at the University of Washington. We meet every Friday at um, 1.30 p.m. and uh, invite exciting and excellent speakers to come and chat with us. Uh, today, I'm really excited to invite Jeff Iknowski. I, I, I asked him how to pronounce his last name. I hope I did a reasonable job. Uh, and uh, uh, so Jeff did his uh, PhD with Ron Altrovitz at UNC uh, at Chapel Hill. Um, worked on a bunch of stuff, uh, particularly with surgical robots uh, that we have since also worked uh, with Ron on. So I think we inherited some of Jeff's, uh, Jeff's work. Um, really interesting and exciting work there. And then uh, is doing a postdoc right now um, at uh, Berkeley. Uh, and uh, today he's going to talk about uh, some of his work in his postdoc and possibly also uh, his PhD thesis. Uh, super excited to have Jeff here with us. He's also on the faculty job market um, and uh, wish him the very best on that. Uh, we'll defer questions until the very end, please, because uh, Jeff has a, has a decent talk. If you have any burning questions, just put them in the chat and I will try to moderate it um, for the rest. So. Without further ado, take it away, Jeff. Great, thank you. Um, super excited to be here. Uh, really looking forward to any uh, follow-up conversations and so forth. Um, so I will, and thanks for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, so uh, we'll get started. So my talk is dynamic robot manipulation, learned optimization, deformable materials in the cloud. Um, but put another way, I really just want to make robots move, manipulate, and compute really fast. Um, so. Uh, a lot of my earlier work was looking at how do we sort of uh, use uh, grass motion and dynamic planning sort of separately, but I, I'm trying to look at how do we break this assumption. So can we compute grass motions and dynamics simultaneously? Um, similarly, uh, did a lot of work with rigid body assumptions, rigid world assumptions, and I'm looking to see if we can break those assumptions as well. And I've also done a lot of work in trying to relax this or enable uh, much more extensive use of computing to get rid of these bottlenecks that we have with uh, onboard computing that many robots have. But a lot of these assumptions I do want to start off by saying are really good. We get great models, theoretic results, and practical results. Um, but sort of more specifically, what I'm looking to do is say, can we combine grasp and motion planning and dynamics? So if we say, compute the grasp and motion planning together, can we shorten that reach to grasp motion or the reach to place motion? Or if we integrate motion planning and time, time parameterization, perhaps we can get the motion planner to bend the path to be faster. And if we start integrating dynamics into our motion planning, we can start thinking about lifting quasi-static assumptions that tend to slow down the resulting computed motions. Uh, in a similar vein, I'm looking at, can we start um, looking at dynamic deformable manipulation with the notion that a lot of the world is dynamic and, I'm sorry, deformable, and if we can use dynamics, we can potentially speed up folding, packing more. We can manipulate objects that are out of reach. Um, perhaps we can also increase reliability of these manipulations. And also uh, to set the groundwork, uh, using the cloud I find is a really exciting uh, avenue for speeding up the computation for a lot of these, these things because maybe the, the most effective way I can put this is just an example. If you have a hundred fold improvement of uh, computing using the cloud, and then you can take something that takes over a minute to compute and make it a sub-second computation. So you can really accelerate when these uh, manipulation plans or motion plans or whatever you're trying to do um, to be practical now instead of waiting for the computing hardware on a robot to catch up. So with that laid out, here's the agenda that I'm going to go through. I'm going to talk about the integration of grass motion and time parameterization, then get into learned optimization dynamic deformable and cloud robotics. So starting off, uh, one of the things that we've really experienced a lot in the past couple of years is this huge demand increase for e-commerce. So we started off by thinking, how do we start thinking, how do we start keeping up with the demand created on uh, robots and logistics operations, e-commerce and so forth? And a lot of it really comes down to this pick and place operation. Uh, how do you fast, how do you quickly pick up an object, place it in a desired location, whether it's bin to bin as I'm showing here or shelf to shelf or bin to shelf or some other combination. And if you look at the pipeline, 
uh, pick and place tends to start off with uh, imaging, segmentation, grasp analysis. And then from that grasp analysis, you get a pick motion, maybe a place motion. And due to a lot of advances, uh, some of it done uh, there, um, is uh, that front end is really no longer a bottleneck. It's really done fast and effectively through deep neural networks. And what's happening is motion, the motion, the actual motion times are dominating the cycle times for uh, logistics operations. So let's start off with an example. So we take maybe a grasp analysis of a cup and the grasp analysis is gonna say, you can pick up that cup at these two contact points and it will result in a stable grasp of object. The robot will be able to transport the object reliably and safely. One of the things that happens a lot is that they just plan a top-down motion to that grass to pick it up and place it. What we realized was that actually implies a degree of freedom. The grasp analysis just said those contact points were actually good. It didn't say that it had to be a specific angle. So we wanted to say, could we incorporate this degree of freedom into our optimization? So walking through how we formulated this, uh, we basically set it up as an optimization problem where we want to minimize the time it takes to execute a trajectory subject to the grasp analysis constraint that I just showed you, the obstacle avoidance, and the joint limits. Now, you're probably aware that those first two things are not convex. So I'm going to walk through how we set this up, and it also sets up the, the stage for later parts of the conversation or later parts of the talk, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on this part. So the way we set up the optimization is that we start off with the discretization of the trajectory with configurations velocities uh, over a fixed uh, time horizon with a fixed time step. And we set up an application specific uh, uh, optimization objective here. We're saying the sum of squared accelerations, but it could really be a, a variety of things. Um, so I'm gonna walk through first how we do that minimization of the sum of squared accelerations, and then talk about how I, we minimize time after that. So the optimization we set up is we've got that quadratic objective already. Then we just need to start adding the constraints. We've got the, the constraints on the joint limits the, and dynamic capabilities that, that we want to keep the robot within the capabilities of its actuation. These are all convex constraints. We set up boundary conditions. We wanted to start and end at zero velocity and also a convex constraint. We also set up sort of a model predictive control style dynamic constraint to explain the, the, the configuration of velocity over this discretization. This is also a convex constraint. Then we start getting to the non-convex constraints. So I'm gonna walk through an example of how we do this. Um, basically, if you were to look at that bin wall, we could say that this is an obstacle that the robot needs to clear. Um, and the way we need to set this up in the optimization that we're gonna use is we need to be able to linearize this obstacle. So convert it to a local linear approximation of the function. But we have this problem that the obstacle is in the workspace, but we're planning in the configuration space. And so the solution for this is to compute the Jacobian that is just gonna tell us that an infinitesimal change in the degrees of freedom and the joint angles is going to result in an infinitesimal change in the placement of the, the arm. Um, so from that, we can set up a, a constraint that says um, with this Jacobian, let's keep that obstacle, let's keep that arm out of the obstacle um, that we want to avoid. And this, of course, I'm doing a very simplified explanation of this, but we'd have to extend this out to the rest of the robot. And with that, we get a constraint that looks something like this. And we apply something very similar to that uh, grasp contact point. There's a slight uh, complexity here that we have to deal with rotations. But otherwise, the conceptual part is fairly similar where we set up a linear approximation of what's happening in the larger landscape of uh, the trajectory. So putting it all together, we have this entire optimization that we're trying to solve. And we use a sequential quadratic program solver, the one from Tragopt, um, to solve this problem. So we linearize the constraints. We establish a trust region around those, uh, the iterates. Um, we solve the quadratic program resulting from that linearization. And if it improves things, we update the iterate. If it doesn't improve things, we change the trust region and we repeat until we converge. So at that point, we've got a trajectory. And um, as I mentioned, I'm going to get to the time optimization aspect in a second. But the optimization as a result of that is going to look something like this. So on the top, you have the configuration over time. In the middle, you have the velocity over time. At the bottom, you have the acceleration over time. And what we do quite simply is we solve this optimization for that fixed horizon, time horizon of about uh, half a second. And then we 
shrink the time horizon until we and repeatedly solve until the solver detects the problem as infeasible and we take the the iterate before it um, that was feasible and you see that we result in something that has properties characteristics of a time optimal trajectory that at any point in time one or more of the joints is at a derivative limit either the acceleration limit or the velocity limit and you can sort of see that with the the flat lines at the edge of the you know actuations when we put this on a real robot we get very fast uh, pick and place motions and when we compare it to the prior work baselines uh, we get a, a huge amount of speed up and kind of the funny thing that we now observe is that the gripper closing speed is actually now our bottleneck. The, the gripper closing and opening takes more time than the actual transport of the object. So we looked at this in a little more detail and we found that uh, we were not optimizing jerk and as a result, or con controlling for jerk, um, we were just sending the trajectories as fast as we could to the controller inside of the UR arm. And uh, then we found that it was overshooting and we recorded the plan versus played back versus uh, actual trajectory and play it back in this overlay here. And you can see that because we're not accounting for jerk, we have this slight overshoot at the end. The, the control in the arm is trying its best to follow it, but it obviously has jerk limits that we need to obey. So the simple thing might be just to say, let's add jerk limits into our optimization, uh, just extend it out a little bit. But the weird thing happens when you do that is the compute time explodes. So we now adding those jerk limits in we get this median compute time of 28 seconds which is you know really not useful for computing these sub-second trajectories and that leads into the next part of the agenda learned optimization so we wanted to look at speeding up this computation and we took two approaches we took uh, we look at the outer loop and the inner loop how could we speed up both and i'm going to start off by talking about the outer loop and then i'll get to the inner loop next. So for the outer loop, we said, let's see if we could get deep learning to uh, do this whole optimization for us. So we set up a pipeline where we generate a bunch of random inputs from a uh, distribution likely to see when the robot's actually running. You know, here's a pick points, here's the place points, here's a set of them, randomize it, generate the optimal trajectories, put it into a database and train a neural network. And then at runtime, we would say, let's put in those uh, start endpoints into the optimization, into the neural network, get a very fast forward pass through that neural network, hit a trajectory and run it on the robot. And I'm skipping over a lot of the details about how we had to train this in order to get the, how we had to do uh, updates to get the neural network to actually learn something. Um, a lot of things involve getting the obstacle model to be very smooth, um, that you know, small changes within the start and end conditions of the, the trajectory can't result in large jumps in the trajectory from the optimization. I'm skipping over those details, happy to go into them in more detail. Um, but the gist of it is even with all that done, we have this problem that we're trying to ask a neural network to compute these time optimal trajectories. And the bottom line is that at any point in time, one of these trajectories, one of the joints is at a limit. So if the neural network mispredicts even slightly, it's going to exceed a limit and the robot is either not going to be able to follow the robot, just essentially e-stop itself, or it's going to imprecisely follow the trajectory and kind of do its best effort. So what we had the key insight was, well, we weren't able to get the best trajectories out of it. We were able to get something that was really, really good, good enough that we could take the neural network output and use it to warm start the optimization. So our new pipeline is to take that input at runtime, run it through the neural network, get a very, very fast approximation of the warm start trajectory, and then use the same SQP from before to fix up those uh, joint limits and get everything run it, runnable on the robot. So we sort of, as a result, get the best of both worlds. We get this really fast prediction from the neural network and the exact constraint satisfaction of the SQP. And when we put this all together, we got our compute time dropped from 80 milliseconds, to, I'm sorry, from 28 seconds to 80 milliseconds, so making it very practical for actual use, uh, essentially a 300x improvement on uh, the optimization time. In this work, and once we put it onto a robot, we get you know, the better, um, less overshoot and so forth. And it was uh, on the cover article of Science Robotics. Um, so moving on, the other thing we looked at to speed up the computation was to speed up the inner loop, this quadratic program solver. 
at the inner loop of the sequential quadratic program resolver inside of the time optimizing grass optimized motion planner. And to just lay out a little bit of the, the terminology that I'm going to be using, so the quadratic program uh, solver solves uh, this quadratic program, which has um, a, a quadratic objective, that P matrix there, subject to linear constraints, the A matrix with the lower and upper bounds defining the constraints on that. And while I'm talking about in the context of uh, this grasp optimized motion planning, I do want to say that quadratic programs, as probably many of you are aware, are used all throughout robotics. I've used them in all these different projects. Um, so it's really something that's going to be beneficial or is beneficial to uh, more than just this one specific problem that I've been showing. So we were using OSQP, a very popular open source quadratic program solver. Uh, and while we were generating you know, 100,000 data points and getting frustrated with how slow it was and, you know, putting it on a whole bunch of different machines to try to parallelize the data generation, uh, started looking at how to speed it up and found a way to speed it up. And I reached out to the first authors of OSDP, Bartolomeo Stellato and Goran Banjak, and we formed a collaboration to uh, speed up OSQP. And I'm going to go through what we came up with. So to give a little bit of background, um, on how OSQP works before I get into how we set it up. Uh, OSQP works by creating a matrix, a KKT matrix, based upon that uh, quadratic objective and linear constraints in this matrix I show here. And it repeatedly solves, uh, performs a linear solve on that matrix and performs ADM up updates to project on the bound and repeats until it converges. Now, part of this is that there's this step size parameter rho that has a significant impact on the convergence rate of uh, OSQP. And it's got these really interesting properties that OSQP will converge regardless of the value. It's really only the rate that is the issue um, on how you set it row. And it's okay to change row between iterations subject to some constraints. Um, and the optimal value is unknown. So if we're using all these properties, what we decided to see if we could do is see if we could learn a policy. And specifically, we came, we used reinforcement learning to come up with what we called RLQP, a reinforcement learning based uh, QP solver. And the, we set it up like this. So we have our QP solver, which is environment, it's fully observable. And every iteration it takes, it's going to get a reward of negative one. So we want to minimize the uh, or maximize the reward. So every time we're taking a step, we're, uh, you know, uh, getting a worse reward. So we uh, are encouraging the solver to, to solve as soon as with as few iterations as possible. And we also send the state to the agent that is training. Now, part of what's going on here as well is we're trying to get a policy for a single scalar, this row bar. And OSQP has a few heuristics that it uses to extend that out into a vector. And we're going to just borrow that heuristic from before. Um, and it looks a bit like this on the right here. So we're taking their heuristic in the red up on the top where they were computing it based upon the primal and dual residuals to this learning-based um, policy to predict row bar. And then from row bar, we get the row vector by using the second heuristic, uh, which just multiplies the row value by whether or not, uh, by a value depending on whether or not it is a uh, equality constraint or an inequality constraint. So we got pretty good performance. I'll get into that in a bit. But what we wanted to do as well is see if we could get this uh, to be even faster. And so we looked at, could we adapt, uh, could we come up with a reinforcement learning policy to adapt the individual, individual components of that row vector? Uh, so one of the issues that we have here is that uh, quadratic programs can be expressed in any permutation of their constraints. So we wanted our policy to be invariant to that. There's also a varying number of constraints uh, between one QP and the next potentially, and we didn't want to be fixed to a fixed size uh, QP. So with those in mind, we came up with a vector-based learning policy using an idea from one policy to control them all that we essentially learn a single agent policy that we can apply to every single coefficient of the vector. So if we have M constraints um, and M values in the row vector, we essentially batch apply 
that uh, state to compute a batched value of that vector. Um, and we modify the training policy accordingly. So when we put it into experiments from off the shelf benchmarks on a variety of problems, uh, so control, Huber, support vector machines, lasso and portfolio optimization, and we compare the results to OSQP, um, we outperform OSQP on every single benchmark. So here you can see, uh, pay attention to the purple one, that's the vector or multi-agent policy. We are outperforming OSQP on every single one except for equality, uh, but equality essentially couldn't go any faster. And in some cases, we're now able to outperform a popular commercial solver, Groby. When we did a little bit more analysis on the policy that it learned, we found that it was very consistent with, uh, with theory, that essentially it was, rho was higher in the places it was supposed to be higher and lower in the places that it was supposed to be lower. But overall, we get this highly nonlinear function that uh, we learned through, the, uh, through RL. And uh, that was at NeurIPS last year. So that was the learned optimization. And now I'm gonna get into the dynamic deformable uh, work. And I actually have this in three parts. So I apologize, I lied a little bit about the agenda. We're, there's actually three sections here. So the first one I'm gonna show is, we were able to get the motion so fast that we now have these transport problems. And specific, if we try to transport open top containers, you can see that contents spill out at somewhat unpredictable points in the trajectory. And we wanted to start controlling for that. So our idea was to introduce inertial constraints to this optimization. Uh, so here you can see what we're trying to do sort of pictorially is that we want to keep the, uh, the container normal aligned to the inertial accelerations experienced throughout the motion of the, the arm. And we already have the dynamic values of the joints because of our optimization, optimization from before. And our idea here was to plug those joint states into a recursive Newton Euler uh, equation to get the accelerations at the endpoint. And then with those accelerations at the endpoint, we can define these constraints to keep the container normal aligned to the inertial accelerations. And when we put this together, we get motions that transport objects very quickly without spilling. We also get these really nice emergent properties like the robot is like swinging back here in order to build up momentum to go over the top. Something that we didn't code in other than to say, here's the constraint that you need to obey. So we also looked at, well, how do we define that constraint? So we want to make sure that we do not spill content. So if something's gonna spill, if we tilted that 15 degrees or just after we tilted beyond 15 degrees, we wanna constrain the tilt angle to be 15 degrees. Similarly, if we have a lower fill level and we can tilt the uh, cup 45 degrees, maybe we can go faster. And the answer is yes, we can. So here we have that 45 degree tilt constraint and you can see that it's actually going upside down for, for, for that top part of the motion, something that we could not have computed with the quasi-static motion planner alone. We also received the challenge to go upside down and we were able to. Uh, so here you can see again, something that we could not have done if we uh, tried to compute this statically in time parameter, time parameterized later. So I'm gonna go quickly through the results, but essentially one of the things we wanted to see is does adding these inertial constraints slow down the motion and how much does it slow down the motion? And what you might expect as a result is that they slow down at some, but if there's no obstacle in the way or the tilt constraint is relatively relaxed, that you experience a relatively minor slowdown compared to not considering this constraint. So we also got this challenge to solve the rushing sommelier problem where busy restaurants cannot keep up with demand for delivering alcohol to their thirsty customers in time and applied it to transporting uh, open top wine glass. And this again, you saw from the beginning title sequence, but that's how we did it. Um, so going on to the next part, dynamic deformable part two. So we also wanted to see if we could speed up suction transport. Now, one of the things about suction transport is it doesn't have that gripper close issue that we had mentioned before. Suction is becoming the mode of choice for grasping because it's so quick to turn on and off. But it does suffer from a problem where if you accelerate too fast, objects will break out of suction. 
So we wanted to start formulating, how do we get that suction grasp constraint into the motion planning uh, along the lines of that open top transport problem? And we thought through, okay, there's a bunch of different ways to model uh, the suction constraint. Uh, lots of really great work that has done this before. And uh, what it starts to amount to is that you've got to look at the friction uh, of keeping that suction in contact. You've got to look at the pressure, keeping it uh, pulled into the suction cup. You've got to deal with the moment and making sure it's in sort of quasi-static equilibrium. And there's potentially a lot more assumptions that you can model into this and try to like put into the constraint optimization from before. But one of the key problems that we have here is that all these models sort of either have to assume out deformation or they have to start com a complex modeling of it. So here is a slow motion capture, three frames from suction breaking. Um, so we start off before, you can see the suction cup is pulled in and uh, compressed against the surface. And as the arm moves away from the, the grasped object, you can see the cups start to stretch out finally breaking contact in the last uh, frame. Now, the interesting thing here is that that deforming part, the deformation that happens there, the, before the suction breaks, the, the robot could actually stop its acceleration away and uh, not lose contact with the, the, the object it's transporting. So revisiting that discussion from before, how do we put that deformation, deformation into the the model, well, we could start to think, well, there's this time dependent sequence of accelerations. There's the deformation model that we need to keep under some uh, limit. Um, but, you know, because it takes multiple frames, multiple over time uh, waypoints, uh, we need this uh, deformation, deformation constraint to be based upon a, a sequence of uh, inputs. But it gets more complicated because as it's deforming, the contact changes, so that would change your friction coefficient and, uh, sorry, it would change your friction contact and potentially change the suction and moment and so forth. So instead of going through all that analysis, which we could simulate potentially, um, but it would probably be slow, we wanted to see if we could learn this. Could we parameterize this function by a neural network and learn it and keep define the constraint as something that we just want to keep below a threshold. And I have here that it's sort of like a probability of dropping, but really it's just a thresholdable value that we're, we're trying to get to. So we come up with this two-phase project process. The offline process does a whole bunch of self-supervised data collection, followed by data augmentation, trains the neural network function, and then we use it on online. And I'll get to the online part in a second. But the part about being able to uh, learn the suction model is that we really needed a good signal of when suction breaks. So we came up with this custom uh, gripper that most importantly has this pressure sensor outlet. So we plug in a pressure sensor into that point and we get a very, very clean and fast signal of when suction breaks. And it was actually very cheap to do. So um, a very scalable process in that sense. So then we do training. We form a whole bunch of lifts uh, of the object. And we always lift vertically. The motion's always vertical. We just change the angle at which the, the gripper is uh, holding the object. And we repeat this for a variety of angles. And we can start to look at this as, uh, start to use domain knowledge here that we can explore the boundary of motion profiles that cause suction to break, knowing that if we go slower than a motion that keeps suction keeps the suction grasp, we can, anything slower than that, we can keep, um, we'll say it works. Anything faster than a motion that breaks suction, um, we also can, uh, you know, not have to go any faster. So we really pare down our landscape of uh, data that we need to collect. And after we do that, doing this boundary search, we can start to do data augmentation, essentially fill in the rest of the grid to whatever extent we want, knowing that anything faster than something that broke is also going to break, break suction. And similarly, anything slower than something that held uh, will keep the object in hold. So we set up a training process where we learn this constraint. And we provided an input of the end effector accelerations over time. And we came up with this history of states of here, we're saying of six states that we're putting into the constraint function based upon just looking at how long it took for the video, for suction to break in that video that we, we um, 
we captured. And we trained this with the very simple labels of one for failure, uh, zero for success, and threshold it be between below some value and put it into our optimization. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, we need to be able to linearize this constraint to put it into our optimization. And to linearize it, we want to use the Jacobian. And now we get this really nice property is that because we're using a neural network, we can just use the autograd from the neural network to get our Jacobian and we get our linearization. So we put it together into our whole online process. And now in the middle here, we have the GOMP uh, suction transport optimization that is repeatedly linearizing this constraint based upon the learned neural network. And when we run it on the robot, we get a uh, fast transport of the heavy object without breaking contact. And when we look at the results, we see that um, compared to some analytic baselines on, I'm, or we call them unimodal, multimodal. Another way to think of, it, of, of them is sort of optimistic and pessimistic. Um, we get uh, comparable success rates with the varying uh, D safe value to our pessimistic model. When we also look at uh, ablating out that history to see whether or not the history is an important factor in learning this function, that H equals one in red column, we see that history is critical. Uh, without the history, that suction, uh, the suction transport always fails. It always falls out of grasp. When we compare the times, we see that we get uh, between a 16% and 58% speed up compared to the analytic model using this learned model. We also, I've sort of been glossing over this, but we also tested on unseen masses and found that it, uh, it works there as well. Another way to look at the generalization to unseen masses, is we plotted in simulation the trajectory time by varying the, the mass of the transported object and that safety threshold parameter. And we see the landscape looks uh, what we'd expect it to look like with heavier objects and higher safety uh, thresholds. Um, the motion goes slower and conversely, it goes faster. All right, so that gets to dynamic deformable part three. And this is perhaps my favorite paper title ever. So inspired by Raiders of the Lost Ark, we came up with Robots of the Lost Ark, ARC where we wanted to do self-supervised learning of, to dynamically manipulate fixed end cables. Um, or put another way, we want to solve the problem of the vacuum cleaner power cord being on the wrong side of a distant obstacle. And we defined a whole bunch of tasks. Uh, we have the vaulting task where we want to vault the cable over a distant obstacle. We want to maybe hit something down on task two, and we want to weave between obstacles uh, at varying distances to show the, the capabilities here. So the way we set up the problem is that we've got this fixed end point, which is plugged into the wall, and we've got the other end point of the cable plugged, uh, held by the gripper. And our idea here was to come up with a trajectory that we parameterize by, a, we have a fixed start and a fixed end point, and we have a learned apex point. And with that single learned apex point, we fill in the rest of the trajectory using an optimization from before. So we get that arc of the motion just by defining where that learned apex point is. But before we could get to learning the system, we, we found that there is a huge sensitivity to initial conditions. So here we have the exact same motion repeated 20 times and overlaid uh, in this image. And what you can see is that just by minor variations in that start in that initial condition, how that rope is laid down on the floor results in a massive uh, variation in the uh, resulting placement of the, the cable. So we came up with the idea of doing a reset motion. So the reset motion is very simply, it pulls the cord taut up and down slowly. We could probably do it faster, but since it's not the sort of objective here, we just wanted it to get it to a repeatable start condition. Um, when we do this, our repeatability goes from the top right to the top bottom. It becomes very repeatable. So now that we have this reset motion, we define a pipeline where we go from the robot on the top, where it goes from the initial, initial state of the rope to after the reset. It then segments the image to find out where the obstacle is. It does uh, a neural network to compute the uh, apex point, which we're parameterizing actually by three joints. 
And then we run it through the trajectory optimizer to compute that final trajectory that we run. And um, I'm going to skip through this, but we, you know, backronymed in uh, Indy as our self-supervised training method. Um, and then when we run it on the robot, we are able to vault over far obstacles, nearby obstacles. We're able to knock down objects on pedestals, which I still don't know what the utility of is, but we can do it. And it's kind of fun. Um, and then we can also do weaving between objects at different distances. And just uh, looking at time, I'm going to sort of skip through the results and get to another uh, work that we have recently uh, uh, published or gotten accepted, where we're looking at can we do free end, um, uh, can we get a free end of the cable to a particular point using a single dynamic trajectory? And here you can see some of the results that we get from this problem setup. And the method that we proposed here was to do what we call real to sim to real, where the idea is that we collect a bunch of self-supervised um, you know, examples of what happens when the robot does a particular trajectory. We then tune a simulator to match real as, as well as possible using differential evolution. And from that, we get a simulator that we can collect a large amount of data from. And with that data from both sim and real, we train a policy that we then use to run on the robot. Now, one of the interesting results here is that when we train that network just on physical results, or we train it just on simulated results, we do not get as good results as if we train on both sim and real data sets. Uh, so this is kind of a really interesting result. I, the hypothesis is a bit that we get really high quality data from the physical and we get a large amount of data that is not great quality, but close enough from the simulated results. All right, so moving on to the cloud robotics point um, and the theme here being, how do we speed up the computation? Well, let's look at a classic problem of a robot trying to get across a room. Well, a really effective way to do this is to do sampling-based motion planning or asymptotically optimal sampling-based motion planning where you essentially generate a whole bunch of random samples to connect into a tree to get from start to goal. Now, one of the bottlenecks to parallelizing this, you might say, let's sample everything in parallel and speed it up using you know, cloud computing being the theme of this part of the talk. Well, one of the big issues is that when you try to update these shared data structures like the nearest neighbor data structure or the tree, um, generally, the way to do it is with locks, but when you're locking a data structure, you're causing one or more cores to not process and you result in some underutilization of the, the CPU that you're trying to, the CPUs or cores that you're trying to use. So all that waiting is essentially useless time that we're not speeding up the, the motion planning. So the idea that we explored was could we essentially make all of uh, sampling based motion planning lock free? And once we do lock-free updates, and it is kind of exactly what it sounds like, is updating and querying data structures without using locks, we can start to use all the available computing power on the, on the robot or the cloud computer. Uh, looking at another way is here's what a simple motion planning problem looks like on one core. And if we run on four cores or even 32 cores, we start to get, with the same amount of wall clock time, more and more optimal trajectories. And we apply this even to a, a whole body motion planning problem. So here we're computing the uh, sampling based motion planning for uh, manipulation plan for the whole robot to move and place the uh, book in a, in a uh, drawer. And we used a 72 core cloud computer. And looking at another way, this is what that 72 core cloud computer looked like when we were running that. Uh, we're using all 72 cores, 100% of CPU at the same, you know, on all of them. And sort of the real exciting result here is that with one hour, we get one hour and 45 minutes of CPU time in under 90 seconds of wall clock time. So we've just incredibly sped up the, the capabilities of that motion planning problem. Now, um, one of the ways that we start to think about using the cloud is that there is different costs associated with using it. So um, for example, let's take a problem where we have a robot navigating the halls of uh, Washington and trying to declutter. So as it's navigating a slow dimensional problem of 2D navigation, it's probably gonna be able to use its onboard computing. 
Once it gets to a manipulation task and has to start using eight degrees of freedom and potentially more, well, we've got a higher dimensional problem that uh, could benefit from that speed up of parallelized motion planning. But the compute requirements are gonna change over time. So we have these simple problems and pro points in time where the robot's just moving and not using compute, maybe complex motion planning problems come up, but there's just real sporadic demand in the compute. And you know we might get to some uh, desk. This is an actual desk at Berkeley, uh, where we get a very complex planning problem where we need a lot of computing time. But as I mentioned, having that always on high-end computer for short bursts of intensive computing is inefficient. So what we explored was, could we do uh, what's called serverless or Lambda computing? And the idea here is that you get a single function computation without a dedicated server. And it's got this nice property of being billed in 100 millisecond increments. So you pay for exactly how much compute you use. Now, serverless computing has a lot of limitations. Um, I'm gonna skip through all of them, except for the kind of most important one is that they have limited multiprocessing capability. And, current offerings limit it essentially to two hardware threads per uh, serverless computation. So the idea we explored was if one multi-core lambda is too slow for a motion planning problem, perhaps we can use multiple multi-core lambdas working in parallel to compute the motion plan problem quickly. And we used a asymptotically optimal, or we based it on an asymptotically optimal motion planner called RRT star. And the idea here is that RRT star generates random samples connects them to a graph, and then looks in a region around that random sample and rewires the graph towards optimality. And you repeat this and you get an asymptotically optimal sampling-based motion planner. It also has this nice uh, addition that people later uh, found that if you um, reject samples that could not improve the plan, so if you have a path from start to goal, that anything that can't improve that plan, you can just quickly reject and move on to a sample that could. And that has a huge speed up benefit for these motion planning problems. So we came up with this uh, multi-core, multi-lambda motion planner that combines a, a bunch of these ideas and ran it on 10, 100 motion planners. And the only thing that they're sharing is that best path that they found that can sort of get the efficiency from the uh, rejection sampling. And when we run it on common benchmarks, we can see that using one for 1600 lambdas really does improve convergence rate a lot across all of these different examples that we put it on. We also put it on a manipulator problem where we wanted to say, let's see what happens with this eight degree of freedom problem. We'll give it one, 10, 100 lambdas at, and the same amount of wall clock compute time. And we can see that the 100 serverless lambdas is able to compute a motion plan faster and more efficiently, um, or a more efficient motion plan than the 10 serverless lambdas. And if we compared it to just one lambda, or sort of equivalent to what the robot might compute on its own, the robot was not able to get a single solution. So this is kind of an exciting result because we get you know, massive improvements on our robot's capability just by spending a few extra cents in compute using the cloud. But cloud robotics is easy. Um, so we looked at, or, or actually actively looking at creating a, a platform that makes it easy. We're calling it Fogros2, credit to Ken Goldberg for the pun of the name there. And the idea is to make robot operating system ROS, which is a de facto standard, very easy to use with the cloud. And perhaps the easiest way to explain what we're doing is say you have a robot that has a problem where it wants to do grass planner and wants to do motion planner. Um, and both these benefit from GPUs or multi-core parallelism, but the robot only has two cores and no GPU. Well, with Fogros 2, what we can say is just let's change this configuration for launching the robot's operating, uh, the robot's uh, application. And Fogros will take care of the rest. It will provision a computer in the cloud, it will set up security, it will move the code to the cloud, a bunch of things that it does for you. But essentially, you start getting the cloud computing these things on good hardware to accelerate the, the computation. The launch sequence looks like this. I'm gonna skip over this in the interest of time. Um, but when we run it on some off the shelf examples, so we, we ran it on uh, SLAM and we get half the latency using the cloud. When we go from grass planning without a GPU on the robot to using a GPU in the cloud, including the transport time over the network, we get a 12X speed up. And when we do the multi-core motion planning compared to the robots, we get up to a 28x speed up. 
So uh, that's about it for the meat of the talk. I'm going to give a few uh, slides on future work and limitations. Uh, would love to talk about these more. So I'm going to go through these quickly and maybe leave them to questions. But a lot of the concerns about using cloud computing is even though we get the scalable benefit um, of uh, hardware, faster uh, computation and so forth, there are safety critical time real-time concerns, privacy and security concerns that we have to work through, and we're still thinking about how to work through them. Um, you know, so for the future, 5G or 6G networking can start to address some of these uh, time-critical network activities. Uh, but we also not, might need to start thinking about criticality, criticality aware distribution of computation or privacy-aware computation. Um, but even so, we're, we've got a lot of progress on this. We're actually actively looking at making this an official part of ROS2. Um, and hoping to get many more features available um, in the future, um, including a few ideas of making web-based visualization, um, multi-robot coordination, multi-robot learning, and so forth. One of the things I didn't discuss, um, but would love to discuss more, is we started using neural radiance fields to compute grasps on transparent objects, and we're very successful at it. Uh, the biggest bottleneck there was uh, um, the compute time that it took two hours to compute the neural radiance field. Uh, but with instant NGP, we can now get these grasped in like 30 seconds and we see sort of a better future there as well. So we're also thinking about could we integrate this into the optimized motion planning as well. Uh, there are limitations here. Uh, this is probably my favorite blooper reel. It reminds me of Thor. This drink, I like it. I know, it's great, right? Another. Um, so we have this limitation that uh, there are a lot of parameters that we're not taking into account in these fast transports. Um, so could we actively and accurately determine the spill tilt angle, the grass branch resistance? Could we learn the grass branch resistance like we did for suction? Um, and I guess in the interest of time, I'm going to just end with thanking all my collaborators, collaborators who made this research really fun and exciting to do. and. Um, I didn't find all their pictures, so here's their names, and I will end there and say thank you and open up to any questions. So uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, with respect to the, um, you know, seeding optimization with uh, some learned uh, trajectory, mm -hmm. um, you know, back in the day, uh, Mark Chassaint and, um, and, and, and I did a little bit of work on being able to use the optimization runs themselves as a signal for how good you are initializing a trajectory in a basin of attraction. So the key insight being, you don't particularly need to predict the optimal trajectory. You just need to predict a trajectory in a good basin of attraction and then let your optimizer solve that problem. Mm -hmm. um, how does, how does your stuff compare to that? I'm asking an old person question. I can't believe it. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, we, we looked at that um, and uh, we're excited by that, some of the inspiration. Um, one of the things that we had a lot of difficulty with, I sort of glossed over, was how do we get the optimization to actually be something that we could learn a smooth function for? And so those are sort of the details that we skipped over. Um, actually getting into the basin of attraction was a bit difficult until we got to that. And then um, once we got the smooth learned function, uh, we found that we could just um, seed it into the, the warm started optimization uh, from the SQP and get the results that we got. That answered your question. <laughs> to some extent. Uh, more questions? I, I have a Quick question. First of all, yeah, really, really cool results. Pretty amazing. Um, I was wondering with the suction cup, for example, did you, and you learn the network that you then integrate into your optimization, did you train these kind of per object or per mass? Or if, if not, can could you just train a single network that would then maybe almost identify the mass of the object as you're trying to pick it up or something like that, more like a feedback loop? Uh, that's an interesting, so we sort of left the perception side out of it. Uh, we um, uh, are training on, let's see, we, we trained on uh, these different masses. So we trained on like 1.3, 1.5, and 1.7 kilogram masses. 
Um, then we wanted to see if we could uh, have the network generalized between them and do transport of unseen masses. So I have a feeling that it could work sort of in arbitrary settings, but we have to really be able to get that uh, the mass properties and perhaps the friction properties, which we didn't really look at here um, as well. And so that's sort of like the next line of research that we'd be excited to explore. I, I uh, you know, a, a lot of your work has focused on optimizing computation, which I think is super interesting in several ways. Um, I fast forward like five years from now where computers are 50 times faster. Um, mm -hmm. Robots are probably not going to be 50 times faster. Um, and so computation always speeds up physics, gets, gets faster than physics. Like what aspects of this talk do you think will be like will still be relevant and memorable then? When com computing is 50 times faster. Um, Correct. <laughs> uh, so I think a lot of the exciting things that I kind of think about this is that, um, you know, that 50 times faster is easily attainable with the cloud. Like we, what we see in five years from now is what we can get now if we move our computation to the cloud. So there's that aspect of it. So what will be exciting in 50 times, when computing is 50 times faster, well, the, the cloud will, you know, be 50 times faster than the robot then as well. Um, so what do I think as well will be uh, exciting and memorable from this work? Well, the the motion planning, the sampling based motion planning at the end with the lock free updates, uh, originally we were developing on a 32 core machine and now we see it scales to the 96 core machine. So when we get, you know, a 1024 core machine, we're still hopeful that it will still scale and, you know, open up new problems that we can solve there as well. Uh, with the optimization side of thing, one of the things that we haven't really explored is how do we increase the, the efficiency of that? How do we speed it up with you know, parallelization efforts within the cloud as well? And that I think um, hopefully we'll be able to explore and, and get the benefit of the faster computing as well. I think also one thing that I, I think I'm keying off of in your question there, which I think is uh, kind of a really pertinent point, is that robot hardware doesn't change, right? You've got probably robots in your lab from you know how many years ago and the computing hardware has changed and uh, how do you get access to that efficiently? I think that's a sort of a generic problem for, for robotics as well. Yeah. Well, uh, on that note, thank you so much, Jeff. It was uh, such a pleasure hosting you and having, having you give this talk and good luck with everything in the future and uh, uh, looking forward to do great things. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Um, and uh, you know, please contact Jeff anytime you have any questions. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you.